Hey, hey, you guys, and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new here, my name is Chelsea, and I am a mom to a eight-month-old baby girl that we conceived through IVF. So in today's video, I'm gonna share with you the top 10 questions I get asked over on my Instagram. So if you're not already following me on Instagram, be sure to follow me over there. I'll put my Instagram handle right here, and you can check me out over there, and we can chat through DMs, because I love connecting with you guys on Instagram as well as here on YouTube. So if you are interested in seeing the most frequently asked questions I get, and these will be questions specific to IVF, then go ahead and keep watching. All right, let's go ahead and hop right into it with question number one. What embryo grade was Ray? And she was an AB embryo. It's so weird to talk about her like that. Um, but the embryo that we transferred with our first round of IVF, which was successful, um, we are so grateful for that, was an AB embryo. Our two, uh, two out of the three PGS normal embryos were AB. So we have one more AB and then we have a BA. Question number two is, did you work out while going through IVF? Yes, I did. Um, I would do anything from just a, a like one mile walk to a high fitness class. And if you are familiar with high fitness, it's a pretty intense, like one hour long cardio class with lots of burpees and push ups and all sorts of things. I would even do like insanity classes, uh, some weight training, that sort of thing. I just took it one day at a time. If I wasn't feeling well, then I would totally scale back my workout. But overall, yes, I did continue to work out. There was a day that was marked on my IVF like calendar where my doctor told me I shouldn't work out from then on. I think it was a couple days before egg retrieval, but about five days before egg retrieval, I was definitely scaling back my workouts because you feel so heavy and bloated, like you've got bricks in your ab, like not your abs, but your um, abdomen and your ovaries or whatever. So I definitely scaled back my workouts and took it easy. Um, as far as the two-week wait goes, a lot of people ask if I worked out during the two-week wait. My doctor told me only light walking um, until I got a positive pregnancy test. And then after that, he was like, go for it, work out, do whatever you were doing before. Um, if you were very active before you got pregnant and before you went through IVF, then go for it. You should be fine. So that's what I did. Question number three is, were there certain foods that you did or did not eat during IVF? In addition to that, what supplements did you take? This is a super common question I get asked. I actually have um, an IGTV video um, that you can watch where I sort of just casually mention all of the things that I did. But I didn't really have a specific diet that I was following. Um, I normally eat pretty healthy. I'd say pretty well balanced. I try to, you know, just watch what I'm eating and not eat so much sugar and try to do alternative things to just like straight sugar instead of, you know, just eating a ton of like garbage is what I call it, like a bunch of carbs and sugar. I try to like, I make an effort to eat um, healthy and not so much crap. <laughs> but during IVF, I do remember like having some really strong cravings and just it's an emotional roller coaster, and so you kind of want to eat emotionally sometimes because you're just, it's just a lot. So I actually let myself honor those feelings and indulge a little bit in like eating Taco Bell or whatever I had <laughs> during that time. But for the most part, I tried really hard to make sure I was getting enough nutrients in my diet, having like a green smoothie with protein and all that stuff. But I didn't eat a certain diet during IVF. Now I know that there are a lot of studies going on with um, how the keto diet can support infertility and um, IVF and you know low carb diets and things like that, especially with PCOS, but I didn't do anything specific. I just tried my best to get as much good healthy food in me as possible. And then when it comes to supplements, I was taking a vitamin D, um, vitamin C, CoQ10, which I think I was taking ubiquinol, which is the active form of Co CoQ10. Eric was taking zinc, I think. <laughs> Didn't mean to rhyme there. But I have a whole video of the supplements I was taking and how I was prepping for my FET, my frozen em embryo transfer. Um, but during the like stem cycle of IVF, I was 
just taking whatever my doctor recommended, which was all those things I just listed, plus green tea, decaffeinated green tea. But like I said, you can watch my IGTV video that I made and my FET like prep video. And I'm glad I filmed those because I am starting to forget. And so when we have to do IVF again, I'm gonna wanna know what was I doing so that I can refer back and help myself out a little bit. Question number four is when was your beta blood test? A lot of people wonder um, when you get your blood test to test your HCG after your transfer, just to find out if you're pregnant. It's kind of an important thing. So a lot of people wondered that. So I get asked that question a lot in DMs. Um, we got our beta blood test at nine days post transfer. And then our second beta test was a week after that. It was supposed to be a week after that, but we were going out of town. So they brought us in like right before we went out of town. So I think it was like four or five days after that. And my numbers were, my first number was 215. And then my second number on, you know, four or five days past that, which would have been what, 14 days post transfer was over a thousand. I think it was 1200, but remember not to put too much weight on those numbers. They're great as a starting point And you know, certain numbers are going to make you a little happier than others. Like lower numbers aren't going to be as awesome, but at the same time, it's not that they're not awesome. It, like low numbers can still result in a healthy take home baby. So those were my numbers. I always tell people not to try to compare their numbers to my numbers because you know, it's all over the place. Oh, and my first ultrasound where we got to hear the heartbeat was at seven weeks. And I think we even saw the heartbeat, but like I said, I have all these videos listed down in the description below. The next question is what were your first pregnancy symptoms? My first pregnancy symptom was I was so thirsty. Um, I also was pretty tired and had some headaches, but I think that all happened while I was taking the fertility medications. And so I couldn't really say that that was like, oh, right after the transfer, this was what happened because that was going on before. It's so hard with IVF because some things are just symptoms of the medications. It's so annoying. <laughs> but the one that I know was like my first pregnancy symptom was I was so thirsty and I wanted ice water. Um, and usually I drink lukewarm water. <laughs> so that was my first pregnancy symptom. And I'd say that happened right around two weeks post transfer. So right around my second beta test was when I was like super, super thirsty. Question number six is, is PGS testing worth it? And if you've been following me, you know I'm, what I'm gonna say here. Yes, I think PGS testing is totally worth it. I know several people who have resisted doing it because of cost or they just morally or ethically feel like it's kind of controversial. So they hold off doing it, but then later on down the road after having failed transfers or miscarriages, then they go ahead and do the PGS testing. So for me, PGS testing was about $1,600, I think. It was $200 per embryo, which we had eight embryos. So yeah, it was $1,600. So the price didn't seem too steep for us. It seemed like a great um, investment, if you want to call it that. So we just thought, why not make the odds better that this is going to work for us and help us avoid miscarriage. There's so much that can be talked about when it comes to the topic of PGS testing. And if you're not familiar with it, it's just genetic testing that they do by biopsying the embryo once it's about five or six days old and they take a biopsy from the outer layer of the embryo I believe and look at the chromosomal makeup and if it looks abnormal then it's considered an abnormal embryo and they won't transfer it um, it's not PGS normal um, if the chromosomal makeup looks normal um, then it's PGS normal so anyway I have a lot more information about PGS testing in our specific case. Um, I will link those videos up here and down below. So you can check those out. Uh, but yes, I definitely think PGS testing is worth it. I don't know, you gotta just decide for yourself how you feel about it morally, I guess, as well as financially what you're willing to risk. It, I hate discussing IVF that way, but it really is like a gambling game. So if you want to increase your odds, you can 
do PGS testing. Question number seven is, when did you graduate from the fertility clinic and finish up with your medications? And when I was nine weeks, almost 10 weeks, I went in to get a, an ultrasound and we were taken by surprise that that was the day we were graduating from our fertility clinic. And then they said by 10 weeks, I can stop basically cold turkey, um, all of the medications that I was on. So it was like that last shot um, on right when I was 10 weeks pregnant uh, was good. I was done. So that was kind of a happy surprise because <laughs> um, if you've done those progesterone shots or any of those injections, it's just, it's no fun. But we were happy to finish those up at 10 weeks because we thought we had to go all the way through the first trimester. So it was a nice surprise. And I don't know if that's how every fertility clinic does it, but that's what mine did and it worked for us. Um, of course, just go with whatever your fertility clinic recommends as far as getting off of your medications. This next question is just any advice I would give for starting IVF or IVF injections specifically, all that sort of thing. I just have always come to say now that you just need to take it one day at a time. IVF is so overwhelming. Um, if you look at it in like the big scope of things and what you're actually all going through and you're doing all this while well, you have to just keep up with your normal life and then it's a lot and financially it's a big burden and it can be a big burden and stress. So I just say take it one day at a time and lean on your partner. Be very open with what you need from them, you know, how they can support you because you don't want them to feel helpless. You really want them to feel like they are part of this as well and can help you. Um, so Eric was a super big part of why I was able to get through IVF with mostly a positive outlook. So yeah, take it one day at a time, lean on your partner for support or find a friend who's been through it that you can really connect with and ask questions and somebody that will just let you talk about what you're going through and how you're feeling. Uh, the IVF community here on YouTube is amazing. Same with on Instagram. So reach out, find support. And then just understand that you are not in this alone. So many people go through IVF, unfortunately. Um, so there is a community of people waiting to help you. I was part of a local Facebook group when I was going through IVF and infertility, and that helped a lot. Okay, question number nine is, did you do the ERA test before your transfer? No, we did not do an ERA test. If you're unfamiliar with what that is, it's basically, I think it's an endometrial receptive analysis. Let me ask Google, hold on one second. It's an endometrial receptivity analysis, and I will read to you what it is. It's a genetic test that takes a small sample of a woman's endometrial lining to determine which day would be the best day to transfer the embryo during an IVF cycle. So we did not do this because we just didn't feel like we needed it at the time. We, I researched about it, I talked to people who had done it, and I just was like, I think we're okay. I just kind of went with my gut on that. But we did talk to our doctor about it, and we just planned that if our first transfer did not work, then we would do the ERA with our next transfer. So luckily, our first transfer worked, so we did not have to do that because we had to pay everything out of pocket, and so it would have been another couple thousand dollars just for us to do that test. So because we didn't feel really strongly about it, we were like, let's just let's just forego that and we'll try to try it on the next transfer if we need to. Okay, and question number 10. This is a question I get all the time. And I wondered the same thing because after you have your transfer, you're like, okay, what can I do to maximize my potential for getting pregnant? So the question is, what did you do after the transfer and the two week wait to set yourself up for the best um, result of success, I guess. And I just, I feel strongly that there's not a whole ton you can do. And there are some things you can do to give yourself peace of mind and to, you know, set yourself up for, I guess the best result or outcome, but really there's so many different people that are doing different things, especially for like within the fertility centers. Um, some people say no bed rest because that shows to not work. And some people are like, you've got to do bed rest because that studies have shown that that's what gets you pregnant. I, I don't really know. I feel like fertility is such a mystery. So I always just say, 
go with what your doctor says. So my doctor recommends two to three days of bed rest. So day of my transfer, day after, and then the next day I was in bed basically for three days. Yes, I got up to go to the bathroom. Yes, I sat up in bed. Yes, I would occasionally go down stairs and get something. But for the most part, my husband was like, you're in bed. So I did that. I didn't do any like drink warm foods. I know that's a popular thing. and But I feel like there's nothing wrong with doing that. You can totally do that. If that gives you peace of mind, that that's going to give you a better outcome of you know, being having getting a successful pregnancy, a, a positive beta test, but um, I just feel like just do whatever gives you peace of mind. And in the two week wait, I don't really have a lot of suggestions other than just keep yourself busy. Again, lean on your partner and just take care of yourself, you guys. It's such a tough couple weeks to wait. And with IVF, you only actually have to wait what, nine, 10 days. So just, you know, take it one day at a time again and lean on your partner and your support group. Do things for yourself. Indulge a little bit here and there. Um, take nice long baths. These are all the things that I did. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I'm gonna post my IVF playlist right over here and you guys can click on that to watch my whole IVF journey and get more details into what we talked about here today. I am also gonna probably do another video like this where I answer my top 10 DMs about motherhood and postpartum and all that, all those kinds of questions that I get over on Instagram. So if you are interested to see those, go ahead and subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and I will chat with you guys in my next video. Bye.